where we need to be saved. Now, the Lord God Almighty, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the creator of all these things. For me, the man was created, our purpose, we were created so that we could defeat sin by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the Holy Spirit has given us this book, this book that has no error, this book that has no corruption, this, word, this book that is perfect, word for word perfect, from the start to the end. Not one error. Every single last word of this book is God's gift to mankind. Now, this book explains the kingdom above. This book explains the world that we currently do not live in. But what I'm seeing more and more with this book is that it's using our surroundings, it's using our reality in the carnal realm here to explain the heavenly kingdom that we're laboring to enter into right now by faith. An earthly story with a heavenly meaning. The Lord Jesus Christ tells us in, in Mark 4 and in Luke 8, the gateway to understanding all parables is to understand that the seed is the word of God. So is the seed the word of God every single last time? Is there any seed that's not the word of God? Yes, the serpent has a seed, but where did the serpent get that seed from? Does God give every person their own seed? Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely what I'm seeing right now. So is any at any point, is the seed anything else? but the word of God. I want to talk about that more today, but there's a lot. There's a lot, lot, lot I want to talk about today. As I set out on this, my latest sojourn in the scriptures, it's currently January 19. It's a Thursday and it'd be about 11 o'clock in the morning here in the New South Wales Central Coast. And I'm currently up to Deuteronomy 3. And it's very, very cool out there today. It's been very, very hot here the last few days, all week really. It's been hot and it snapped last night and all of a sudden started raining and it's very very dark although I 
don't think this camera is is showing just how dark it is but it is it is quite dark here at the moment it's an amazing camera on this phone it's it's absolutely terrific but in any case i'm not here to talk about the weather and the camera on my phone right now we all something else i want to talk about and this is what i'm endeavoring to talk about today i've got some bible verses of the day here from late last year and new year's day that i've been i've had them loaded up all that time but I have just every video I just don't get to them so that's absolutely the intent today but as usual a couple of things have come in this morning that's I, I, I don't know I I'm just gonna go with the flow as it were and just see where the Holy Spirit leads me here because I've seen a couple of things this morning as well over the last few days as well as that last video like that last that last video like to that, that 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 scripture about the Lord Jesus Christ. What if they do this to a green tree? What would they do to a dry tree for memory? For me, he's talking about the cross. He's talking about him on the cross, the wood, the wood. People and plants might. So how far does this actually go? How far do we take this? An earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So the 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 spiritual world is playing out in the carnal. And it's being explained in allegory by carnal events. So something I talked about in that last video is okay, if they were reading, if they were writing scripture about us right now, how would that scripture actually look? An earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So we're walking around in our carnal bodies, in this carnal world, walking in the spirit. So if they were to write scripture today about your day-to-day -day life, things that happen in your day, your testimony, and they're writing it down, that's what I'm seeing the scriptures at. It's played out in the carnal somehow, but it's not absolutely just word for word with what is written on the page. It's it's something, it's something I dearly, dearly want to get to. Where does that twain actually meet? Do, do these scriptures at any point just speak purely about the carnal and not the spiritual at all. A prime example of that is when children are born. Is that purely carnal in those scriptures or is there a spiritual element in that as well? Is that in fact an earthly story with a heavenly meaning when, a, when, a, when somebody is born in those scriptures? That's something, I, that, that's, that's my main focus right now is to get more and more understanding on these things and Jamie sister you've left a comment we've been going to and fro with this over the last few days and thank you sister for your fellowship it's just been top notch as usual on this thing but I feel as though now we're on a I feel as though we're on the same page we always were we always were but now I think we're understanding where we're coming from a lot more and you left this comment and it's just helped me it's helped me fill a couple of gaps actually it's a most amazing comment I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to that. In, I'm gonna get to that in just a second. As usual, I've just got the best throat ever, and as soon as I turn this camera on, it just starts to play all these, all these tricks. It's never normally like this, but every time I press record, here it is, on full display. Just to, it's trials, and it's just never stops. Right, never, <laughs> it never stops. Now, the concept of me is something that's been quite dear to me for quite some time not not because i'm you know i'm full of myself and it's all about me it's not that it's what what the concept of me the concept of you what makes you you so we accept responsibility for our actions i want to i want to talk about this I, I, i'll play this now actually i'll play this now so when we do things we accept responsibility for what we do about who we actually are so who are we what controls what we actually are? We're made up of many different attributes inside. So you see me now, and I manifest as the entity called Brett. But inside here, it can get quite complex, right? And we're all, we've all got our own different complexities. We've all got our own different makeup. We've all got our own belief systems. Now that belief system, it can be formed from without, it can be formed from within. But we've at our core, we're all different. So what controls what? Does the heart control the control the mind? Does the mind control the soul? What controls everything here? What controls it all? For me now in the body of Christ, the Holy Spirit controls us. But 
we're not perfected yet. So that means there's darkness still dwelling where the light is, right? Because if we're not perfected, well, that means we're not perfected. And if we're not perfected, well, then we're lower than the light. So the light's shining in our hearts, right? What does that actually mean? I just read something in Deuteronomy that's really caused me to cause me to think about this on a on a on a deeper on a deeper level. Something about Pharaoh as well. Now, repentance and forgiveness, right? I did all that work down there at the park. All of those videos, video after video, right? Down at the park where I was talking about repentance. And the big thing I got out of all of those videos that is still my absolute, it's what, what I'm, it's my view, what I'm being led to think to this moment is that repentance is a choice that's given to everybody. The opportunity is given to everybody by grace. Everybody, he's given that opportunity to repent. And that's our choice, whether we take that take that opportunity or not. Now, I'll just play the clip, right? I don't know if you've seen this, but this is this is the old Prime Minister of England. This is this is Tony Blair. So he was in office when the weapons of mass destruction occurred. The decision to go to war in Iraq and to remove Saddam Hussein from power in a coalition of over 40 countries led by the United States of America was the hardest, most momentous, most agonizing decision I took in my 10 years as British Prime Minister. For that decision today, I accept full responsibility. Without exception and without excuse. Now, whenever I see something like that, a confession like that, it now is leaving me at fever pitch that we're living in these times where they're revealing all the darkness so that Satan can be fully revealed so that the world is going to accept the light, this beast from the sea, which I just see as the arrival is absolutely imminent. But you look at that man there and we know what he's talking about, right? How it was just one gigantic ruse. It was never... You'll never forget that speech of, of George Bush. <laughs> Those weapons of mass destruction got to be somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> As you can tell from the look on Andy Card's face, we've become a little concerned about the vice president lately. <laughs> Whenever you ask him a question, he replies, let's see what my little friend says. But we get along well. Here I am saying, Dick, if the Hunan Palace doesn't get lunch here in four minutes, we're going out. <laughs> nope, no weapons over there. <laughs> Maybe under here. It was all a big joke, right? They're all... They're all laughing at us, and to me, they're all they're all still laughing at us. But they're the laughs on on them, right? We're in the body of Christ. We know that the laughs most certainly on on them. Well, the jokes on them. But I see I see something like that now, and I think right, it, it, it's not legitimate, right? But boy, it looks legitimate. So it's caused me to think: if should we forgive him? Now, the key to that for me is that because he's repented, there's a repentance there. And I never, ever, it's never far from my mind that Judas repented to the Pharisees and they said, see to that. I don't care. Whatever. That's your problem. And then Judah, Judas went and hung himself. What if his repentance had been accepted by the Pharisees? Would he have still have hung himself? There seems to be something with Judas where it wasn't possible for him to repent. Is it because he did it to the Pharisees and not to the Holy Spirit? I don't know. But for me, he, he, he had a repentant heart, right? That's what I'm seeing with that scripture in, in Matthew with Judas. But Tony Blair there, he, for me, is he looks repentant, he looks sorrowful, and he's accepting responsibility. Now, when I see that they've accepted responsibility, for me, that's just meaningless words because nothing ever happens. Politicians do it all the time. I accept responsibility. So if I accept responsibility for something, that means there's certain consequences for my actions because I'm pleading guilty to the sin, so now I, I accept responsibility. 
Okay, give me my punishment. It never happens with these politicians. Not ever, not once, not ever. Just only when it applies to their narratives where these you know, ruthless dictators and their Masonic theatres, they're, they're brought to, to, to justice. Yeah, right. But it doesn't happen, right? So nothing will happen to this guy, even though he was responsible for the, for the killing of countless, countless lives both in America and in the Middle East and, and, and England, all, all of these, and I suspect Australians too, a whole myriad, thousands and thousands of people died because of something that George Bush thinks is just a, a, a great joke. And I've no doubt Tony Blair thinks it's a great joke as well. So do, do, do we forgive him? Is it godly to forgive that man? I'm vexed on it, eh? Do I forgive him? Is it godly? How do we know it's not legitimate? Because he's a creature running the world, right? That's what I'm basing it on, and they can't change. But is that a manifest? Is there more to consider here? It's interesting, right? Interesting. So the concept of me, what makes me me, right? So you look at him, and something drove him to do that, the weapons of mass destruction. For me, it's because of who he served drove him to do that. Now, something's driven him now to take responsibility for that action. Something's driving me every day to do these videos, but also there, there's something driving me all the time when I have adversity. My natural reaction is to get angry. It's diminishing, diminishing, diminishing because of the Holy Spirit. But it's like, it's still there. It's, my anger's most certainly still, it's getting, as I say, it's getting less and less. And I haven't got angry now in a long time, be a couple of years since, since I truly got angry. So I think, okay, what drives that? Where does it come from? Where does it come from? I accept responsibility. What does that mean? I respect, uh, who am I? What am I? You see a person here, but what actually inside, what is me? What makes me me and what makes you you? What controls? For me, it's a belief. A belief controls who we are. I see even atheists. Atheists have to believe in something. Everybody has to believe in something. You hear them all today. You trust the science. They're trusting in something. They're believing. People believe in the systems. People believe in the politicians. I see people steadfastly defending their favourite politician, their favourite celebrity, their favourite Freemason who just sings their tune. I see the cult of personality is rife. We've got these people who I see as the harlots they're just leading these minds astray. I see it over and over again. They're pulling the reins of their hearts. So for me, everybody serves a God. And there's most certainly scripture that talks about this. Firstly, here in Deuteronomy 28, and this, this is where we get the blessings and the curses, of course. And it's just so, it's so, so interesting because you talk about an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, and it come to pass if the, you will hearken diligently to the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all his command, which is I command me this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon thee and overtake thee if thou will hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God. So this is the choice. Do you serve God? Is it God who you serve? Are you going to allow God to own you? Or are you going to serve somebody else? We all serve a God. Blessed thou shalt be in the city and blessed thou shalt be in the field. Now, 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 right? The field. I see this as, I don't know. I see it as a man's heart, but I also see it as we go out into the world. An earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Now get this one. Blessed be the fruit of thy body. And the fruit of thy ground. A, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And the fruit of thy cattle. And the increase of kind and the flocks of thy sheep. And blessed when they come out and when they go when they go in. The other way around, even breath. But I, I see this as spirits going in and out of the, of the house of God. Just as we do today, but we're doing it as carnal entities. So is that what we're getting here? It's what I'm being led to think. Going in and out actually pertains to, as we see it, we see it right through the scriptures going in and out. Now, right down here in verse 64, and this is the curse, and the Lord shall scatter thee among all people from one end of earth and to the other. So this is one of the reasons I'm being led to think we're pre-existing beings, because that's what's happened to us 
we're the scattered strangers, the strangers and pilgrims on the earth that we read about in Hebrews 11 and that Peter's talking to in, in its first Peter, the scattered strangers from one end of the earth unto the other. And the Lord Jesus Christ is going to collect us from one end of the heaven to the other. And there thou shalt serve other gods, which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. Right. So for me, this isn't a choice. The Lord's saying, this is how it's going to be. If you don't serve me, you're going to go and serve other gods. You've got no say in it. That's what you're going to go and do. Now, for me, the choice is to sin. This is a consequence of that choice. So if you don't serve God, you're going to serve another God. And then we get it again here in 1 Samuel 26, when David's flying from Saul. And he says, now, therefore, I pray thee, let my Lord the King hear the words of his servant. If the Lord has stirred thee up against me, let him accept an offering. But if they be of the children of men, cursed be they before the Lord, for they have driven me out this day from abiding in the inheritance of the Lord, saying, Go, serve other gods. So that's what David for me is saying here. If we can't abide in the inheritance of the Lord, if we can't abide in the land, if we can't diligently obey and hearken to all the, all the Lord's commandments in the land, that means now we're going to go and serve other gods because that's the curse that David's talking about here. So if you don't diligently obey, you're going to be scattered from one end of the earth to the other and serve other gods just as I'm being led to think you do did. And I most certainly did. I most certainly served other gods. Looking back, I served money. Money was my confidence, absolutely, and also myself. I most certainly served myself and anybody that was on the right side of politics. I, I had my favourite politicians. I, had, I served sportsmen. I most certainly served beer. They were my gods back in those days, and that's what, that's what David's talking about here. Go serve other gods if we can't serve the Lord. And we get it again in Micah 4. I'll go straight there in verse 5. For all people will walk, everyone in the name of his God, and we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. So that's us now in the body of Christ. So we're letting everybody else walk after the name of their God, unless they're drawn to us and they're straight, man, unless, the Holy, unless they're drawn to us and the Holy Spirit gives us that, that precious opportunity to be able to save that person by his grace. And I'm seeing that more and more. That's who we are. We're the sent preachers and we're the vessels of the Lord. And it's not the lecture. It's not to ram it down people's throats. It's not a work of our own hand. It's when people are led to us. We just diligently work away, patiently waiting for the Lord for the next, for the next event to happen in our lives. For all people will walk everyone in the name of his God, and we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever, because everybody serves a God. We in the body of Christ, we serve the Lord Jesus Christ. You not you don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're serving another God. And we absolutely get it culminating here in 2 Corinthians 6. And what called concord has as Christ with Belial, or what hath he that believeth in an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God, right? So this is the body of Christ with idols. Was this ever a physical building ever once in the scriptures? And what agreement hath the temple of God, the body of Christ with idols, right? The gods of wood and stone back in Deuteronomy. For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them, the Holy Spirit, Exodus 25, 8, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Because God's our God, that means he is our Father. We serve God. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, right? The idols, the sons of Belial, the unclean spirits. And wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. So for me, everybody serves a God. And the God that we serve 
to me is our trust, whatever we trust. So even atheists, for me, they serve atheism. That's their trust, but they also have to trust something. You have to trust something, whether it can be your, yourself. For me, yourself can be your God, the works of your own hands, right? So I, I got this this morning, and this is what I want to talk about today, but I'm not sure if I'm going to get to it, because there's a few things here I want to talk about as well. So I got this through in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, and this new big calendar mum got me. It's off to a crack and start, this colour. It's just incredible how how it's gone so far. We're only 19 days in, and it's just been incredible, this calendar. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, And the very God of peace, so peace be unto you. I see this as the seed of Noah. Rest. Let us labour, therefore, to enter into that rest. And the very God of peace, sanctify. So separate, consecrate, you holy, right? So that word holy, we only get it the one time. It's Greek word G3651, and it's to be perfect, complete in all respects. So I see this as the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, the perfection of the body of Christ, the perfection of us. So let the very God of peace, peace be unto you, sanctify you, consecrate you, separate you, divide you, holy. Not divide within ourselves, but divide from the world. We are the Nazarites. And the very God of peace, sanctify you, holy. The finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, perfection, complete. And it's no different to the original command given down to the man. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Now, is this talking about an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, right? So I see fruitful. These are the fruits of the spirit, the fruits of faith. Be fruitful and multiply. Now, I see these as the fruits of our righteousness. The original command given down to the man. An earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And replenish the earth and subdue it, right? And have dominion. So that word replenish, that's what we're getting. So it's to be full, be full, fullness, abundance, to be full, accomplished, be ended, to consecrate, right? To consecrate. That word consecrate is sanctify. It's the same thing, right? And the very God of peace sanctify you holy, holy, holy. And that word holy, it's to be perfect and complete in all respects, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply the, the fruits of your righteousness and replenish the earth, and it pertains to being full, abundance, to be accomplished, and to be ended. And so for me, we're, we're getting a companion scripture here in that word holy, and also sanctify. So here in 2 Corinthians 3, we're reading that the body of Christ, that our walk, our story, our progression of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is the epistle of God that's written in our fleshly tables of our heart. It's just monumental. It's, it's incredible. It's incredible to think. Now, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. How far does this how far does this go? So this is where Paul's talking about the ministration of condemnation and the ministration of death. But now that which is done away is glorious, much more that which remains is glorious. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, right? Now, how far does this go? Paul's using great plainness of speech. So Paul, for me, reveals a whole heap about this Old Testament as I see he speaks in this plain speech. Now, this, this, this chapter is becoming a whole heap more interesting for me just today as I think about it. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded until this day it remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. How far does this go, right? An earthly story with a heavenly meaning. The key to understanding all parables is to understand that the seed is the word of God. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Now, when we read it, it's Moses. For me, it's I'm being led to think it's the entire 
Old Testament because that's what we get. It's taken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even until this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, it shall turn to the Lord. The veil shall be taken away. Now, the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass. It's just amazing this. So this word open as it pertains to open face, it pertains to that veil being taken away. And this word glass as beholding in a glass, this pertains to us looking into a mirror. So now that veil has been taken away from our heart in how to read this Old Testament. Now with open face, the veil is taken away. We now behold as in a glass of glory. So looking straight into the mirror. So we're looking into that mirror and what's looking back at us, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even by the spirit of the Lord. It's just huge, this. So how far does this go? But their minds were blinded, for until this day the remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. So how far does this actually go? Because in John 15, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. So the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking in parable here as he talks about fruit, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit, right? Bring forth more fruit. So what does that mean? Our fruits are being multiplied. So then we come back into Genesis 1, and that's the original commandment given down to the man, was it not? And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over it. So, all over the fish of the sea, etc. So, this, this now for me is, is the big question. Fruitful for me here, no doubt, is spiritual. Otherwise, how can we go and be fruitful? How can I be fruitful now carnally? I go out and plant, plant fruit trees. Is that what the Lord Jesus Christ is talking about in John? No. An earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Be fruitful. We hear that today. Go and do something. You go and be fruitful. Here, I'll give you $50. Go and be fruitful with it, right? It's a saying. It's an allegory. And here it's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. The man's been commanded to be fruitful and to multiply and to replenish the earth. So to be fruitful and multiply. This becomes for me now critical because what's this multiplication? If this is spiritual, does this all of a sudden automatically become carnal? No. For me, this is spiritual too. So this multiplication of the man is not for man to multiply carnally and go and spread out abroad upon the earth. This commandment for me is to increase the fruits of, of your righteousness, the fruits of faith. And that's what the Lord Jesus Christ is saying here. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it so that it bring forth more fruit. He's gone back to Genesis 1.28. It's the original command of the man. It has not changed. Verse 16, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. So same thing, right? Be fruitful and multiply. This is being fruitful because we're multiplying the fruits of our righteousness by faith in God's garden and that your fruit should remain and whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he shall give it to you. And then we go into the command, right? Wherefore, I command you that you love one another. And I look at this and I'm not pushing that we don't love our neighbor and we don't no, 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 nothing like that. But for me, this is very, very clear. that This is talking to members of the body of Christ. That's the command, that members of the body of Christ are to love one another. Yes, the Lord Jesus Christ does say, what thank have you got if you just love them that love you? Absolutely. But this scripture here, and we get it in 1 John as well, for me, this is pertaining to brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, loving one another as, the, as themselves, right? Because we all become ourselves we all become one so you become me i become you 
we all become Jesus, who's already God. We all become one, right? That's what that's what loving thy neighbor as yourself pertains to. So the Lord Jesus Christ here is talking to the body of Christ and he's telling them to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth because that word replenish, it pertains to the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what we're getting here in the Bible verse of the day in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, right? So we've been separate. We've been sanctified. Come out from the unclean thing and I will receive you. I will and separate yourself and I will receive you. The command is always is a promise by faith. So the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, right? So we've been taken out of the world so that we can bring forth more fruit. Be fruitful and multiply and replenish. We've been sanctified. We've been separated so that we can do these things. So then Mark 4. Mark 4, where the Lord Jesus Christ is giving down the Luke 8 and Matthew 13 parable. They're different. In every narrative, they're, they're written down differently. And on the good, good ground fell, <laughs> it did yield fruit that sprung up and increased and brought forth, right? So this is the seed, the word of God. This is where the Lord Jesus Christ says, well, if you don't know this parable, how are you going to know all parables, right? Because... This is what we're getting here for me in 2 Corinthians 3. But their minds were blinded, for unto this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. And for me, that's what the Lord Jesus Christ is talking about. If you don't know this parable, that veil is still upon your heart. It's, it's critical. It's vital to understand anything that the seed is the word of God. It's absolutely critical because this is what the scriptures have been talking about since the start, since Genesis 1. Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. It was the command, to, the original command to the man and it has not changed to us in the body of Christ. And this is the seed, the word of God that fell upon the good ground, our heart, our field our plot on the farm and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth. Be fruitful and multiply. If you don't understand this, you're not going to understand any of these parables, right? So then we come into 2 Corinthians 9. I'll go straight to verse 10. Now he that ministers seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown, comma, and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. The key to understanding all parables is to understand that the seed is the word of God. Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. It is absolutely no different. So this scripture in 2 Corinthians 3 for me now, it's taking on a whole new meaning. That veil is taken away. And for me, you can't know any of this without testimony. Testimony is absolutely critical in all this. The seed is the word of God. I have just, it, for me, it's taking on just a whole new significance. So back in Genesis 1, 28, that's the command to be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it and have dominion over everything. Now, that's what I say. This here is increasing in the fruits of our righteousness because the seed is the word of God. So the seed, so the Lord God, he's, he's giving us that seed to minister for, for bread for our food so that we can go and multiply our seed, so thus increase the fruits of our righteousness. And it was absolutely no different here. No different here. It's been the command from the outset. And this is the command from the Lord Jesus Christ in John in John 15 that you should go and bring forth fruit. Be fruitful and multiply. This and this and this are all companion scriptures and it all ties in to being of the understanding that the seed is the word of God. Then you're going to know 
all parables. That's the gateway. For me, this is the mother of all parables. So this is a this is a companion scripture as well. And for me, that's what Paul's talking about here. That that veil's been taken away. And how about this? This is just, this now, my goodness gracious me, I've got a new level of understanding for this now. So now that that veil has been taken away, we're looking into a mirror and what are we? what's looking back at us out of that mirror? It's the glory of the Lord because now we're being changed into that same image from glory to glory. And of course, back in Genesis 1, the man was created in the image of God. And this is the restitution of all things. So that's what I say. I'm most certainly seeing companion scriptures here all over the place, but not least of all, we get this word replenish in Genesis 1.28, and it's to fill, be full, be full, fullness, and to be full, accomplished, and be ended, to consecrate, to separate, to sanctify. And this is the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ and the very God of peace, the seed of Noah, the seed of rest, sanctify, separate you, holy, and that's what we get for this word holy. Perfect, complete, in all respects, the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the very God of peace, sanctify you wholly and I pray God your whole spirit right oh look at that your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ so the word whole as in whole spirit is Greek word g3648 we get it these two times let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect so the finished work go forth be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and entire, wanting nothing. The God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless. So I read this, that your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless. I'm seeing here that the, that the spirit, the soul and the body are being rolled up into the one thing Hence, it's been called the whole spirit, soul, and body. Be preserved. So this for me is the concept of me. We're all made up of different parts, different body parts in our house, different aspects to who we actually are. And here we're getting a body, soul, and a spirit, and they're going to be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is pertaining to the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. The 144,000, the true Israelites, in whom is no guile. That's what's going to save us in the day of wrath. It's the progression of faith. It's the seed of Jacob. It's who we become by faith. And it was the original man given down to the man in Genesis 1.28. So this word whole, as I say, we, we get it these two times, complete. In no part wanting or unsound, complete, entire, whole. Of a body without blemish or defect, whether a priest or a victim, free from sin and faultless, complete in all respects and consummate. So it's very, very consistent indeed. So it's quite a Bible verse of the day to get right now for me because for many, many reasons, the concept of me, who we actually are, what makes me me? What makes you you? What controls what here? I think my understanding, my basic understanding of these things, because I've felt fond for people in the past. I've had a couple of people in my past where, and they've, I've, I've had other people, never seems to align for me though. <laughs> the ones that I do, they don't, and the ones that do me, I don't them, right? That's just been the story of my life, and that part of my life I've long, I've long forsaken, I've long given up. It's much more peaceful this way, and it's a distraction right now that I don't know. But in any case, it's my experience that the heart controls the mind. Over a period of time, you can be strong in the mind to put aside what your heart actually feels, and over a period of time, most certainly, time will heal and you'll be able to overcome. But for me, the heart controls the mind. That's my understanding now. 
So where, where does the spirit come in and where does the soul come in? Because what I've been saying lately is still what I'm being led to think is that we've all got a seed. We're in the body of Christ, all have one seed. So I'll just speak about the body of Christ just for now in terms of this. So we've all been given one seed, one brick in that house. The seed of Abraham is the seed of faith. The seed of, the seed of Isaac is the seed of the promise. The seed of Jacob is the, is the seed of the translation by the progression of faith. The seed of Noah is the seed of peace. This here, the seed of peace and rest. So we achieve this with the seed of Abraham, the seed of faith, because we're the seed of Isaac, the seed of the chosen, and we get there with the seed of Jacob, which will leave us in this state of being saved, being preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We can only achieve this with the seed of Jacob. Thus we become the seed of Noah. And then we go into glory, which is the seed of David, the father of the star children, the end, the glorious finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ and his body. And we all become one with one another, one with the Lord Jesus Christ, who's already one with the father, on the throne with the Father, the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now you've got a seed and I've got a seed and we in the body of Christ, we all share each other's seed. Every one of our seed is our brick in the house that we're tilling in our land, which for me is our heart. And that seed in our land, our heart grows up to our garden, our garden, our soul, and the leaves and the trees and the fruits on those trees are our fruits and the physical fruits. Well, the actual, it's not physical, it's an allegory, but the fruits on those trees, in those on those plants, is our fruits that manifest to members of mankind out there now. So that's how I'm, that's how I'm most certainly seeing it. But there's no spirit there, right? So what does the spirit do? What controls us? What controls us? Who are we? And what makes you, you? And what makes me, me? And what makes us make the decisions that we make? So think about the days before you had this, uh, this, this glorious framework of the gospel to live by, where we had to make decisions. What form those decisions? It's my decision. What makes, okay, it's my decision. What, what determines what I choose? You have to think about it. Okay, where do those thoughts come from? That's what I'm trying to articulate here. Where do the thoughts come from? You look at people out there who are just absolutely vile. Why? What makes them vile? We look at them and go, well, yeah, you're vile. You're vile. Uh, the bike next door, I've had troubles with him. I just don't think he's a nice man at all. So why? What makes him like that? Where does it come from? And you see other people, there's very, some very, very pleasant people around here. Very, very pleasant indeed. A lady I used to talk to is a lovely, I used to live next door to. She's a lovely lady. So what makes her different to him? Where does it come from? But we see them and we see the manifestations of what's going on within them. And we go, well, you're, you're a nice person and, and you're, not a, you're not a nice person as we look at them physically. But there's something going on inside them that makes them like that. So what is it? Where does it come from? They take responsibility, but it's like, why? Why? Because are they controlling who they are? You've got to take responsibility for your own actions, right? So where does it come from? Who are we? Where does all this come from, right? So I just read I just read this in Deuteronomy 2, and I thought, wow, I've never noticed this one in verse 30. But Sihon, king of Hezbon, would not let us pass by him, for the Lord thy God hardened his spirit, right? The Lord thy God hardened his spirit, and made his heart obstinate, that he might deliver him into thy hand as it appeareth this day. So I've been talking about big conjunction words in those scriptures of late, and I see this is another one. Because is this two different things? Or are we reading that this caused this? So because the Lord, right, who controls us? The Lord, right? The Lord, because the Lord hardened his spirit that made his heart obstinate or are we talking about two different things the lord they're completely separate from one another 
the Lord thy God hardened his spirit and he also made his heart obstinate. I read this as because the Lord hardened his spirit, that made his heart obstinate, which means the, the spirit is controlling the heart, right? That's what I might think might be going on here. That, we get another big conjunction word, that he might deliver him into thy hand as appeareth this day. So that's what I say. We've got another big conjunction word going on here. So this is telling me that the Lord God has hardened the spirit of Sihon. And the way I'm reading this is that by hardening his spirit, that made his heart obstinate. So the spirit controls the heart potentially. And then we get that. So the purpose why he did these things was that so he might deliver him into thy hand as appeareth this day. So this was, for me, this was for a testimony for the children of Israel. This is so the children of Israel could witness the Lord's glory. That was why he raised up Sihon, king of Hezbon, and he made his heart obstinate by making his spirit hard. And we also get this in, in Romans 9, where we read of, Pharaoh, for the scripture saith to Pharaoh, even at this same purpose, have I raised thee up that, right? We get another one. I might show my power in thee and that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. So this is something that really, I will say it troubles me because I don't have understanding of it. For me, the Lord is creating people and raising people up so he can show his glory. But I think, well, what about that person? It makes me think, don't get me wrong, I've got no sympathy or no, there's no nothing for these creatures running the world. But for me, that's why they're there. The Lord has raised them up for his own purpose so that he could be glorified in them for a witness, for a testimony. And for me now, it's all about people repenting so that they can serve God, making that choice to repent. But that's what, for me, that's what's been going on ever since the start of the creation. And for me... That's why the serpent was created. That's why evil was created so that the man can create, can, can create, so that man can defeat sin in our carnal bodies by faith. So sin has to be present. Sin has to be dealt with. And in 1 John, we read that that's why the Lord Jesus Christ, that's why, why the light was made manifest. That's why we've got Genesis 1 3, so that he could, he could defeat the works of the devil which is lying, deceiving, sin, which ultimately leads to death. Now, Paul asks, well Paul, well, Paul addresses the question that I ask here. Therefore, he hath mercy on who he have, will have mercy and who he hath hardeneth. Thou will say then unto me, why doth he yet find fault? For who has resisted his will? Because what's Pharaoh done? What's Sihon done? God's done it. For me, God controls us. God controls our heart, our spirit, our soul, the whole lot. But it's about who we serve. What we do plays a role in all this. But did it? It does in the modern day, most certainly. Go serve other gods. But we will serve the Lord because we've repented. But Sihon, did he have a hope? Did Judas have a hope? Did Pharaoh have a hope? What's the sin of Pharaoh? What's the sin of Sihon and what's the sin of Judas? Because they all just, yeah, their sin manifests in the carnal realm. It's, it's quite obvious what their sin is. But this is what Paul says. Well, who's, who's resisted his will? It's all God's will, right? And this is the thing. It's all God's will. Everything is God's will. And that's the big advantage with serving God is that, that no longer, it, it's no longer grievous. It's glorious. Because the more you realize it and the more you pursue it and the more you serve the Lord Jesus Christ by serving this glorious gospel, the, the more, the, 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 more the, 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 the will of God becomes more glorious. It, it's no longer grievous. And that's, that's, that's the beauty of it. But we've got, I've seen three here. We've got Sihon and we've got Pharaoh and we've got Judas. Who's 
resisted God's will out of those three, right? Because God's raised them up. That's the thing. God's raised them up. They will say unto me, Why does they yet find fault? For who has resisted his will? But Naomi, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that has formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter had power over the clay of the same lump? Oh, I want to talk about that too. Oh, yes. I want to talk about the lump because in Corinthians, it's for me, it's becoming very, very apparent indeed that the Lord Jesus Christ, the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ, is the new lump and he's the first fruits. So the Passover lamb is a carcass. The dead Lord Jesus Christ is a carcass. The resurrected Lord Jesus Christ is the first fruits. And then what I'm seeing from that Passover lamb, they've then got this new unleavened lump that happens straight after, straight over that Passover is slain on the 14th day of the first month. And then we've got this unleavened, we've got this unleavened lump, and that's exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ is. I absolutely want to talk about that as well, but I've got so much right now I want to talk about. And is that what we're, is this the same deal, right? The same lump, the unleavened lump, cast out the, the, the leaven anyway, of the same lump to make one vessel unto honour and another unto this dishonour. So it's all to do with God's purpose. It's all to do with God's will. And this is a scripture I've often found a great deal of rest in a great deal of sanity in because my affliction is most certainly not a choice. It's something that you're born with. And for me, it's just led me to dig deeper and deeper and deeper into these scriptures about why these things are so. Why has thou made me thus? Don't reply against God, right? But for me, I don't know. I, I still... It's something that I still dearly, dearly want to know more about. Like, yeah, you look at Pharaoh and you think, yeah, and you look at Sihon, you think, yeah, and you look at Judas, they're all members of the creation who needed to be. So all of this, it's scriptures, right? It's called the scriptures for me for a reason. The whole thing is a script. And they're three characters in the play that were absolutely necessary for these things to take place. I don't deny that for a minute. But what about those three actual people? Because we read in the New Testament that Satan actually entered into Judas's heart and he had no choice. Like, did Judas do anything wrong before that? It's hard to know, right? It's hard to know. Satan's entered into his heart, so then he's not his own. But yet he bears the consequence, him, whatever him is, wherever that comes from. So Satan then controls him. But yet it's his soul that's cast into hell forever. And it's the same as Pharaoh. And the only reason why Pharaoh's heart was hardened was that so the Lord could be glorified. It's just, I, I don't know, it's just, it's something that baffles me to this day. Just about justice and judgment. Like they're now going to spend eternity into hell because the Lord wanted to be glorified in them. So there's always more to consider, right? Always, always more to consider. But in any case, it's interesting because this is what I say, the Lord thy God hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate. So that's what I say. It's leading me to think by the Lord hardening his spirit, that made his heart obstinate. And it's so that the Lord could be glorified, right? So I'll quickly look at the words. So we've got hardened is Hebrew word 87185. And it's the same Hebrew word as I will harden Pharaoh's heart. So it's interesting, right? So he's hardened the spirit of Sihon and that's made his heart obstinate. So did he do the same to Pharaoh? Has he actually hardened Pharaoh's spirit? And this now is an outcome. For me, if I'm in truth, that's exactly what's happened, right? Because if I'm in truth, by hardening his spirit, that's what made his heart obstinate. So what made Pharaoh's heart obstinate? 
it's because the Lord has hardened his spirit as well, right? That that's what I'm being yeah, that's what I'm being led to think. Now, we have a look at it's they're interesting words. We get it 28 times. We get hard, hard, stiff necked, and grievous and miscellaneous. So we get that twice. And it's the scriptures that I most certainly thought that, that you don't, don't be stiff necked just like your fathers. They're a stiff necked people. To be hard, severe, be fierce, be harsh. To be hard, be difficult. To be hard, severe. To be ill treated. That's interesting, isn't it? That's interesting. A hardened hero's Pharaoh's heart. To be hard pressed. To have hard labor of women. Hard labor of women. It's interesting, actually. I'll I'll share this. I'll share this now. Just consider consider these two scriptures here, right? So I just saw this when I was processing the video. Here in Mark 4, where we read of the seed that fell on the good ground and did yield fruit that sprang up, right? That sprang up and increased. Now that reminds me of Hebrews 12. I think it's 15, lest any gall of bitterness spring up, right? Which pertains to your offspring and your children. So then that's exactly what I'm seeing here. This fruit that's growing in our land, in our garden, are our offspring, our children in our house that we're bringing forth. Be fruitful and multiply. That sprang up and increased and brought forth. Brought forth, right? I read that and I thought, okay, okay, okay. Because... When we look at the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ in Luke 1 and verse 31, and behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and call his name Jesus, right? Now, this is one of these moments where I just want to make it absolutely clear that, yes, the Lord Jesus Christ did manifest as a fleshly man and he walked the earth. But I've been putting it down, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. I be, where does the twain meet? I've been putting it down where I think the twain very well may meet in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ as he walked the earth. That's where the, the allegory stops being allegory and it starts being carnal, but it's also spiritual because the Lord Jesus Christ is as spiritual as you can get. So he's a fleshly man that walked the earth, but he was also a spirit. For example, he went in and out all the days of his life on the earth. We get that in Acts 1, and I'm being led to think that pertains to going in and out of the temple of God, which is Jerusalem. Spirits going in and out of the house, just like the Lord Jesus Christ does today, just like he did his whole life. So when I put this down, yeah, absolutely. The Lord Jesus Christ was a fleshly man that walked the earth. But I'm also seeing this is where the twain may very well meet. This is where it ceases, potentially ceases being a parable and starts being carnal. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But I absolutely want to make it abundantly clear that, yes, the Lord Jesus Christ, his life, he's not a parable. He's not, a, he's not an allegory. He's a fleshly man that walked the earth. I want to make that absolutely and abundantly clear because I know treading out this corn and and working on those scriptures, I most certainly do it in the fear of God. And for me, the Lord Jesus Christ, the resurrection, it's the hope. That's our hope. Is that The resurrection is our hope. And the Lord Jesus Christ couldn't be resurrected if he didn't manifest as a carnal man. So I want to make that absolutely and abundantly clear. So Luke 1 and 31, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. So life comes from the womb of the woman. So in Mark 4, And other fell on good ground, and it did yield fruit that sprang up. Now it's evident that our Lord sprang out of the tribe of Judah. But I'm being led to think that pertains to the resurrection, but I'm not settled on that yet because he did most certainly come from the tribe of Judah, I think. He's of the seed of David, but there's no carnal connection between David and the Lord Jesus Christ. For me, the, 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 the carnal connection that I see it 
is the seed, which is the seed of David, which is the seed of glory. But there's no carnal connection, but what connects them in the carnal is that spiritual seed. It's just like us today in the body of Christ. We've got no carnal connection at all, but what connects us as carnal entities is that seed. And that's what I see with the Lord Jesus Christ springing out of the tribe of Judah. But when we read this in Mark 4, We've got seed falling on good ground, which did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth, right? Is that not exactly what Mary has gone and done? We've now got that good ground, the womb, right? We've got that good ground, the womb, bringing forth a son and calling his name Jesus. And on the good ground that did yield fruit, Jesus that sprang up out of the tribe of Judah and increased and brought forth and thou shalt bring forth a son and call his name Jesus. That's what I've been saying that you've got you've got the, 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 the life comes from the earth and the life comes from the womb and the earth is a, is a she. We read that right through the scriptures and we've got those words seed and sow and conceive. They're the same. It's the same Hebrew words. And it seems to me that the woman conceives the seed and the man sows the seed. I've been really trying to consider what that actually means. Sowing seed and conceiving seed. So what comes first here? Sowing the seed. So when you sow the seed, you put the seed into the ground. But then when you conceive the seed, does that mean the seed appears? Does that mean the seed now has been brought forth? What came first? What came first? I, I Maybe I need to look at the English words. I might do that as I go forward. But for me, that's what's most certainly gone and happened here is we've got the good ground bringing forth fruit. And you're going to call that good fruit Jesus that sprang out of the tribe of Judah that did spring up and increased and brought forth, and you will bring forth a son and call his name Jesus. And we also get it with Elizabeth and John the Baptist. Now Elizabeth's full time came that she should be delivered, and she brought forth a son. Now I also see this in the Old Testament, where there was a great travail with the children of Israel, coming out of the land of Egypt, birthing pains, right? That she should be delivered, and she brought forth a son, Mary, she brought forth a son out of the fruit of her womb. And I will bless the fruit of thy womb and the fruit of thy land. And every time it's about the fruit of your land, it's about the fruits of your righteousness, the fruits of the spirit. And right through these scriptures, I see these children being born because of the, the relationship with the Lord and their parents. So Ephraim, and Manasseh, and we had it with the 12 tribes of Israel, and also this screenshot I got up, and also with Hosea. It was due to the works of the parents, that's why those children were born, and that's why they were actually given those names. And the Lord Jesus Christ means Jehovah is salvation, and Christ means anointed, right? So I saw that before, and I thought, okay, I wonder... I wonder if there's I wonder if there's something actually going on there. And that's what we're getting for this word hardened, right? So the Lord will harden Pharaoh's heart and the spirit of Sihon. And that's what we're getting here to have severe labor of, of women. To make difficult, to make difficulty, to make severe, make burdensome, to make hard, stiff, to make stubborn, obstinate, and to show stubbornness, right? So I will harden. Pharaoh's heart, there it is, Pharaoh's heart, and also the spirit of Sihon. For me, as I say, because his spirit's been hardened, that led to his heart being made obstinate. So it's interesting, right, because I'm just thinking as well now that we've got a man's heart, right? So heart, heart is the land heart is the ground and we've got life coming from the ground and we've got life coming from the womb all this is connected i know it 
I know it. I know it. I can feel it in my spirit. This word obstinate is a very interesting word indeed. It's quite difficult to try and discern. We only get it 41 times. Strength and courage, strong, courageous, hard and speed, stronger, confirm, establish, fortify, increase, steadfastly minded, obstinate, and then we get prevail, be strong, alert, courageous, brave, stout, bold, solid, hard, be strong, brave, bold. So he's he's hardened the spirit of Sihon that's made his heart obstinate. And it seems to be pertaining to courageous and strength and stout and seems to be strong in faith. That's what I'm seeing here. But we get in B, we get to strengthen, secure for oneself, harden heart, make firm, make obstinate and assure. So that's what I see in the scripture. Sihon king of Heshbon would not let us pass by him for the Lord thy God has hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate that he might deliver him into thine hand as it appears this day. So the Lord has used Sihon by making his spirit hard and that led to his heart being obstinate. So this is what I say. I'm seeing now potentially the spirit may very well control the heart. Now he did this so he might deliver him into thine hand as he appears this day. So he's raised him up for his own purpose. And that's what I see with this word in B here. To strengthen, secure for oneself. For oneself. To harden heart. Make firm. Make obstinate. Assure. Maybe that's what it's pertaining to because the Lord has raised him up for his own purpose. But what I'm most certainly seeing is by the Lord hardening his spirit, that's made his heart obstinate. And for me, that's potentially what was going on with Pharaoh the whole time. So it's now led me really to be at fever pitch that this whole thing could be about the spirit. The spirit, there may be a new level here that the spirit actually controls the heart. Because all this has got to come from somewhere. All of this emotion that we feel, all of these, what makes me, me, and what makes you, you, all of the inhabitants within our house, it's all got to come from somewhere. Our thoughts, our thoughts. So you wake up in the morning. What's your first thought? Why? What put that thought there? You reap what you sow. Okay, so why are you sowing those things? Where do, you, where do your thoughts come from? People do stupid things. Why? Why do they think it and why do they then act on it? People that do stupid things because they're silly people, right? But why? What sets other people apart? What is it? Why have some people got this? I know people in my life in the past, I've referred to them, they've just got no filter. They just let it all blurt out. They're just, they've just got no filter. No self-awareness is another one. Why? What drives all these things? That for me potentially is what's going on. That the Lord controls us all, but that manifests by him giving us over to the desires of our own heart. It's about who you serve. It's about who you trust. Do you serve money? Do you trust science? Do you trust Freemasons? Do you trust lies? Or do you trust the Lord? It's about who you've got faith in. So then the Lord, he will then turn you over to, he will let you be whoever you want to be. So the Lord God hardened his spirit, but here it's different. I don't see where Sihun's done anything wrong. Because the reason why he would not let them pass by was because the Lord. It's not the Lord did this because he did not let. No, no, no. The whole reason he didn't let them was because the Lord hardened his spirit. But in any case, let's move on, Brett. What I want to put down is what I've been putting down is that what I'm starting to see now potentially is by the Lord hardening his spirit that led to his heart being obstinate. So then when you, when you apply what I've been saying is that this is a war for our soul that's going on in our mind that's determined by who owns your heart well, how about now if we've got a new level to that, your heart is owned by 
who owns your spirit, right? There's a new level going on here. The actual spirit controls the intent of the heart. Could this be, right? Because now I consider this one in 2 Corinthians 4, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts. Now we're given a new heart. We're given, absolutely given a new heart, but the Holy Spirit, the light, has actually shined in our hearts. So we're in a war for our soul that's playing out in our mind, that's determined by who owns this. So what do we need for this to love God? We need this, don't we? Yes, 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 yes. We need this light for our heart to love God. God, because the Lord, he now owns his, our spirit. Yes, our spirit is his spirit. So now our heart loves him because now our heart knows him because we've now got this light. Yes, yes, yes. We've now got this light, this glorious Holy Spirit shining in our heart. So this now why is our heart is set on the Holy Spirit. I feel this is very, very much there. Now, that completes actually the first part of this video and now I'm going to get on to the intent. Well, I'm gonna try and get to one of these Bible verses of the day that I've been, it's been over a month actually. I just had another look at it. It's It's been over a month, but it all ties into the same thing. All this absolutely ties into the same thing about just about where our thoughts come from. That seems to be what this video is going to be about. Now, Sister Jamie, you left a comment a video or so ago that I want to share. But before I, because it's given me some extra context on a couple of things here. But before I do that, I want to put down a couple of scriptures here in Luke 24 that I found very, very interesting for a long time. I'll never forget that day. In Luke 24, 44, where it all changed for me, it was about, I don't know, it was a couple of reads in to the to the scriptures. It was about four years ago now. It, it was, this is a game changer. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spoke unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled that were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. It took me a few goes of reading those scriptures before I saw that. And for me, that was an absolute game changer because I had no idea that the Lord Jesus Christ was in the Old Testament until this scripture had these neon lights around it, the light of the Holy Spirit around it, right? Which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. An absolute and utter game changer. But, 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 this gives me the opportunity to put something down that I've been wanting to put down for quite a while, since my last New Testament read. We, we see here the terms written in the law of Moses, and then we get and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. So we've got the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. Now, sometimes in those scriptures, I see one scripture that leads me to think we can tie quite a bit together here because of this one scripture. An example of this is in 1 Corinthians 14, and I'll go straight there. In the law, it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips, will I speak unto this people, and yet for all that they will not hear me, saith the Lord. So the Lord Jesus Christ is talking, he's, it's separated. We've got the law of Moses, and then we get another conjunction word, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. So on the, on the face of it, I read these as three different concepts. We've got the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. So then when I see this in Corinthians, in the law it is written, for me, I see this, on the just on the face of it and I think okay wherever this scripture is whatever this scripture is whoever wrote this scripture this scripture is actually law so when we look 
at this, it's written in the law. But we've only got the law of Moses here. And then we've got the prophets. And then we've got the Psalms, right? Three different things. So in Corinthians, in the law, it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak to this people. And yet, for all that, they will not hear me, saith the Lord. Now, the prophecy of this comes in Isaiah 28, when we hear the crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim, for me, they're celestial bodies. This is another manifestation where we've got two Israels. We've got celestial Israel and terrestrial Israel because they're going to be cast down to the earth, just like Satan and his angels. We get it also in Lamentations. For me, this could very well be a manifestation of Satan and his angels being cast down to the earth, but they were of Israel. But the Lord Jesus Christ tells them in John 8 that they're of their father, the devil, right? That's what I'm being led to think we're getting here. We're getting the 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 the, the, the sin the sin of Israel in the Old Testament being cast out. And we get spirits being cast out of people, and we're getting angels, who I'm also being led to think getting cast out of heaven. For me, I just know in my spirit there's absolutely a connection there. But we get it, we get the companion scripture here in verse eleven. Whom shall he teach knowledge? An earthly story with a heavenly meaning, right? And who shall he make to understand doctrine them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast, right? So none of us are drinking breast milk here, literally. An earthly story with a heavenly meaning. The milk for me is for the babes in Christ and the strong meats belong to them who are only who are only of full age, who know that knowledge of good and evil. For precept must be upon precept, upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. And we get it here. For with stammering lips... And other tongue will he speak to this people. With stammering lips and other tongue will he speak to this people. In the law it is written with men of other tongues and other lips. With stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. We get stammering lips and we get other lips with men of other tongues and we get another tongue. So that's the only difference as I see it. We've got the stammering lips and we've got other lips. So that's the only, for me, this is the companion scripture, right? This in, this in Corinthians, that's the companion scripture here. So now I'm being led to think that Isaiah wrote the law because that's what we get. In the law, it is written. But we come back into Luke 24, 44, written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Now, Isaiah is a prophet. David is a prophet. I'm going to get to this in just a sec. Just, just quickly put down a couple of scriptures that tells me that. So we've got the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms. For me, all the psalmists were prophets. So now I'm starting to see, well, okay, so the prophets wrote law, right? But the prophets aren't Moses. So this is why I say, I'm seeing absolutely two laws. We've got the law for sin and death, and then we've got the law of life, which is the gospel. And it's all law. The whole thing is law. The whole thing is gospel. Even the law of sin and death for me, because it's all still in play. You fulfill those two great commands and you fulfill the whole of this law. The law hasn't gone away. The Lord Jesus Christ has just taken it out away so we no longer serve it because we're no longer condemned by it. The just shall live by faith. The Lord Jesus Christ has taken that out of the way. For the, the, the first man, Adam, everyone's cursed. But the last Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, he's taken that curse out of the way. So now there needs to be a change of the law. The law is, for me, it's all part of the law of God, but the law of God is including the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms concerning me, right? It's all law. And that, for me, is absolutely confirmed here because this is Isaiah. And it says law, right? In the law, it is written. So that's what the Lord Jesus Christ, for me, is talking about. We've got the law of Moses, but we've also got the law of the prophets and in the Psalms, right? So it's all it's all to do with the law. Now, this, this word stammering is interesting word. We only get it the two times. With hypocritical mockers in feast that gnashed upon me with their teeth. 
with stammering lips and other tongue will he speak to this people. So I'm being led to think this is the body of Christ, right? Well, it seems apparent to me it's the body of Christ. We only get it the two times. We get mocker, stammering, a mocker, and we get a buffoon, also a foreigner, a mocker, and stammering. So it's interesting, right? It's, it's interesting. I'm absolutely being led to think that we're talking here about the body of Christ. Now, in the New Testament, the Lord Jesus Christ, he speaks of the law and prophets quite a bit. We get it a, a few times from him. And that's what he's saying. Wherefore, all things whatsoever you do that men do, the golden rule, do even unto them, for this is law and prophets. That's what it is. It's law and the prophets. So I'm being led to think that this is pertaining to the law of Moses potentially, but this is pertaining to the gospel, which is the law of God. The law of Moses is the law of sin, but the law of God is the gospel, which is the law of the law of Moses, the law of the prophets, and the and the law of the Psalms. That's what I'm absolutely being led to think. But check this out, right? First time, so what I've done is I've searched for the terms law and prophet. And in 2 Kings 17, 13, yet the Lord testified, right? How does he do this? The Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets. So there's a testimony going on here of God in these prophets. Nevertheless, they were disobedient, and rebelled against thee, and cast thy law behind their backs and slew all thy prophets, which testified among them. Right, and then a lot of it here is pertaining to the to the sinful prophets, and it's also pertaining to how the sinful want to slay the prophets. So they're testifying against Israel, and we get this one right in Zechariah seven twelve. Check, check this here. Yeah, they made their hearts as an animate stone, lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts had sent in His Spirit. Right. By the former prophets, therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. So if you've made your heart as an adamant stone, you know you don't have that heart of flesh and this cannot receive this spirit of the prophets. For me, that's what the Lord Jesus Christ is talking about. Law and prophets. It's, there's, there's, there's two laws going on here and I've been seeing there's a law of the spirit and the law, and there's a law of the of the carnal, the, the 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 law of sin and death, and the one I'm talking about in Luke 24, and then we get it quite a bit in Acts, and then this one in Romans 3. But now the righteousness of God without law is manifest, being witnessed. Right, we get it again, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, and that's what they were doing all the way through. These prophets were testifying against Israel due to their sin, and they were doing that by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, I'm just going to touch on the, the words for prophet now in the Old and the New Testament because I want to stay on track. I've still got quite a bit here whoo, that I want to put down. So in the New Testament, it's Greek word G4396, and it's prophet every time, 149 times. In Greek writings, an interpreter of oracles or other hidden things. One who moved by the Spirit of God and hence his organ or spokesman, right? Now, this has become very interesting to me now with what I'm about to put down, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, right? Organ, music, singing, musical instruments, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. But one who was moved by the Spirit of God and hence his organ or spokesman, the Spirit of God. Men filled with the Spirit of God. Now, something that I have been considering here, what are the two things that have entered into the hearts of the body of Christ? We've got the Holy Ghost has moved in. We get that in 2 Corinthians 4. What else do the body of Christ have dwelling in them, in us? We have the seed. What's the seed? The seed's the word of God. What's the word of God? The word of God is the Lord Jesus Christ. We get that in John 1, 1, and John, is it 1, 14? I always get 12 and, and 14 mixed up. But for me, the word, 
is the Lord Jesus Christ. The word of God is the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the gateway to understanding all of these parables is to understand that the seed is the word of God. So those two things have moved in to us. The seed, which is the word of God. So we've got a seed and we've got the Holy Spirit, which is a spirit. So into the body of Christ, into our hearts, have come a seed and a spirit. Right now, what, what I've been putting down lately is I'm seeing that the I'll, I'll get to this actually I'll get to this as I as I go forward. But just we've got a seed and we've got a spirit dwelling now in our hearts. The two things: Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Right now, in the Old Testament, this word prophet is Hebrew word H five zero three zero, and we get this one the three hundred and sixteen times prophet prophecy. Them that prophesy prophet. And we get a variant spokesman speaker prophet and we get prophet and we talk about the false prophets right so a prophet in the old testament is a mouthpiece for god so he testified against israel with all the prophets that he sent with his spirit now revelation 19 i put down this scripture quite a lot of recent i fell at his feet to worship and he said See thou doest it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus, worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, right? So this for me now has just become so, so interesting, next level interesting, because as I say, we've been given a seed and we've been given the Holy Spirit. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of of prophecy spirit so we've received a spirit and we've received a seed this for me tells me that everybody in the body of christ because we have the testimony of jesus and if you have the testimony of jesus that means you have the spirit of prophecy so it's led me to ask the question right now is is the spirit of prophecy a seed are seeds spirits because we've got the holy spirit and we've got the seed the word of god the testimony of jesus is a spirit of prophecy so the testimony of jesus itself is a spirit so is if this is the case if every spirit is actually a seed for example the spirit, the seed of faith, Abraham. So the seed of Abraham is the seed of faith. So is it actually a spirit? The seed of Isaac is the seed of the promise. So is that a spirit? Is the promise actually a spirit? Because if this is the case, I'm seeing that the, that prophecy itself, the actual testimony of Jesus itself is a spirit which could very well be a seed so is this attributed to somebody abraham is the seed of faith we've all got our own seed that we bring forth into the household of god and we all share each other's seed for example we all share abraham isaac jacob david's seed and noah's seed we all share those seeds so is this so for example i look at somebody like i know like elijah is Elijah, is his, is his seed, the seed of Elijah, is his seed actually the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy? Is that because I'm seeing that all these seeds are attributed to somebody and all of these seeds make up the one singular seed of Christ. I don't know. It becomes interesting, right? Because as we know in John 14, we get in verse 16, and I will pray the Father, and he will he will he will she he shall give you another comforter, he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, alleluia, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Right? So the comforter will dwell in us the comforter dwells within us the comforter is the comforter is actually the holy ghost so the comforter is the holy ghost which dwelling which is dwelling within us 
We've got the Spirit of God. We've got the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost here. And we've also got the seed of Christ dwelling within us, right? Is there a seed of the Holy Ghost? How far does this actually go? So John 15, in, in verse 11, these things have I spoken to you that my joy might remain in you. So what's this? This is the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. And verse 26, and when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeded from the Father, he shall testify of me. So right through the Old Testament, the prophets who were prophesying by the Holy Ghost. We get this. I'll go there, actually. We get this in, in 2 Peter and chapter 1. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So the prophets were testifying all the way through with the Holy Ghost. Is the Holy Ghost actually also a seed? And is it is it anywhere attributed to anybody in those scriptures? Just something to muse, right? Just something, something to muse right now. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. We've all got that testimony of Jesus, that testimony. It's the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, and that's he will testify of the Lord Jesus Christ and the comforter is dwelling within us. So it's exactly the same spirit all the way through. The spirit of prophecy, the spirit, singular spirit, is the testimony of Jesus, which is the comforter. And we've had that Holy Ghost shine in our hearts and we've also got the seed, the word of God that's in our hearts as well. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They're the three same things manifesting three different ways. I intend putting this down a little bit further as I go on here because this for me could be significant because if spirits are actually seeds and seeds are actually spirits, well, my, 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 this now becomes so fascinating indeed as it pertains to an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So we've got spirits, we've got the spirit, the Holy Spirit, which is the seed, the word of God that's being planted in our heart. And then that seed is growing up in our garden into our fruits, which are our children, which are the fruits of the spirit. To me, this, this is potentially significant. Our spirits, our spirits actually seeds, our seeds actually spirits the spirit of faith for example let's just go there is the seed of abraham actually a spirit is faith a spirit is the promise a spirit we know the testimony of jesus is a spirit we know the testimony of jesus is the comforter we know the comforter the holy ghost has shone in our hearts and we also know the seed the word of god has also been planted in our hearts and it's just looking like to me now the more and more i go forward here that that's what's going on that the spirit actually controls the heart because we get that scripture in the old testament where their hearts were made as an animate stone thus they could not receive the seed so it's, that's what it's looking like to me now and we we've we're given we're given the holy ghost so that we can get to know god and no man can confess the Lord Jesus Christ is Christ, is, is, the, is the Holy Ghost, but by his Holy Ghost. So I don't know. I don't know. I'm just, anyway, it's something I absolutely want to look at as I go forward here, because my, 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 if this is true and seeds are spirits, the Galatians 5 purge now, it just comes to life in a whole new way. But as I say, this here a few reads ago, well, right at the start, this, this was a game changer. And he said unto them, these are the words which I spoke unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, right? The finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets 
and in the Psalms concerning me. So in Acts 2, we're having Psalm 16, which of course David wrote, being quoted, whom God has raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue, my tongue was glad, moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope. I find that fascinating. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither will thou, right? So leave my soul in hell, neither will thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. And we get in verse 31, neither did his flesh see corruption. So that's that's just so fascinating because the flesh of the Lord Jesus Christ, it for me, it, it lives on. The flesh is corruption, but the Lord Jesus Christ's flesh did not see corruption. Thou has, which leads me to think we're going to be exactly the same. And, and yeah, this is, for me, this ties into this Bible verse of the day, doesn't it? And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved. That's a big word now. Be preserved, blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we've got a spirit a soul and a body going on here. Now in Acts, we've most certainly got flesh. So we've got the we've got the body going on and, and body. For me that's the that's the flesh. And we've most certainly got a soul. Thou will not leave my soul in hell, neither will thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. So is the holy one potentially I, I don't know, is this the spirit? But this it's absolutely a companion scripture, which is telling me that our, so, so who are we, right? What what makes our, us, us and our thoughts, where do our thoughts actually come from? I see this now, this is looking like our household, our spirit and our soul and our body. And these are part of the components that make up us. And this for me is the confirmation because if it happens to the Lord Jesus Christ as joint heirs, it's also going to happen to us. So just as the Lord Jesus Christ's soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh see corruption, that also is going to happen to us by faith. And I pray, God, your whole whole spirit and soul and be body be preserved. So it's just so interesting. It's led me to think now that our flesh actually as well He's not going to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life, that thou make me full of glory with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Right? But his seed. I see David's seed is the seed of the star children. He's dead and buried. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God hath sworn with an oath unto him, that of the fruit of his loins, right? So this is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, that the fruit of his loins according to the flesh. So we get this connection being made again here between the Lord Jesus Christ and David and the flesh, but there's no fleshly connection because the Lord Jesus Christ is the child of the Holy Ghost, the Father is the father of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is what I've been saying. For me, the connection between David and the Lord Jesus Christ, according to the flesh, is the fact that they both have the seed of David. So the seed of David for me is the seed of the eternal glory, the seed of the star children. That's the connection here. So this is spiritual, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So now the Lord Jesus Christ, I am the root and the offspring of David. So the Lord, even though he says in Matthew 22, he seems to say that he can't be the son of David. Matthew 1 for me is very clear that he is. It, it, it does get quite perplexing. and He's the root and the offspring of David. So he's the actual offspring. An earthly story with a heavenly meaning that of the fruit of his loins, right? The fruit of his loins. So I'm seeing potentially this could also be a spirit. This is a seed. This is a spirit. 
This is the spirit of the everlasting glory, potentially, that the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. His throne, right? So this is the throne of David. The Lord Jesus Christ and David, there's just this connection going on right through those scriptures. But undoubtedly here, we've got, the, we've got David. He's being called a prophet. So David wrote scripture. David is a prophet. David wrote the Psalms, right? And that's what the Lord Jesus Christ is talking about, written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms. For me, they've all got the seed of the seed of the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy, which I'm seeing as this seed. Moses, all the prophets, and David, and all the psalmists. So there, you can say there that they're connected also in the flesh, because they're all fleshly entities who shared that one seed, that seed being the word of God, the spirit of prophecy, the testimony of Jesus, which I'm seeing as the Holy Ghost. So that's what I say here. The law, this, it's all the same thing. Law and prophets and Psalms, it's all the same thing. It's all law. But David most certainly is a prophet. But the Lord Jesus Christ, he's of the fruit of his loins. So he's his offspring. The Lord Jesus Christ, yes, he is that prophet. He is the prophet. So he, yes, because he is that seed, right? So the Lord Jesus Christ, I don't know, I, I, I come in now to, to Acts 3, and this is incredible. This is quite, quite incredible. I love this scripture. And Moses truly said of the fathers, a prophet, right? So that's the Lord Jesus Christ. This is that spirit of prophecy, the testimony of Jesus, which is the Holy Ghost. That's the thing. The deeper you get into those scriptures, the more you just see it over and over again that the Lord Jesus Christ is actually God. For me, that's another manifestation there. The Lord Jesus Christ is a prophet. He is the prophet. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus, which is the Holy Ghost. So the Lord Jesus Christ is God, right? Shall the Lord your God raise up? That's interesting too. Raise up, right? I am the root and the offspring of David, and I think there'll be a branch that come forth out of the stem of Jesse. Unto you like of your brethren, unto me him shall you hear in all things whatsoever he shall say to you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people, right? So you don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't have the fear of God. And that's what it's all about. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days, right? The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. But ye are the children of the prophets. So this is so interesting now because this is, they're not my fleshly fathers, right? They're my spiritual fathers. So this is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So we're the children. So we're these plants. Earthly story with a heavenly meaning. In these scriptures, that's what I'm saying. We're the children of the prophets. So we're the plants. We're their fruits. We're their offspring. We're their works their fruits being made manifest for me we are the children of the prophets and the covenant which god made with our fathers saying unto abraham and in thy seed right so this is the seed of faith so is this a spirit and in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed unto you first god having raised up right raised up his son Jesus sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. But we are the children of the prophets. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. So I now look at this in Luke 24, 44. And this is now saying to me, because the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. And we're the children of these prophets. And all of this is pertaining it's pertaining to prophets, right? So everybody in the body of Christ is a prophet. And I'm saying that the body of Christ most certainly are the Lord's lawgivers right now on the earth. That's who we are. Priests, prophets, and teachers. That's who we are because we've got that seed. We've got that spirit of prophecy. But it's just so interesting now because we get Abraham. Abraham's the seed of faith. 
the covenant made, which God made with our father, saying unto Abraham. So it was it was given to Abraham first. So I'm being led to think it pertains to all of them. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, and potentially even Noah. It would be Noah, right? Because it's all, it's all that same seed. So we're the children of these prophets. We're the children and that's what I say. That's what I'm seeing here. Written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me, because law and prophets it all pertains to the spiritual seed, the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy, which is delivering and preaching the gospel. Now, what I'm about to put down, what I'm about to put down about why they worship, how I'm starting to see now. It's starting to get a bit clearer to me now as to why they worship the sun and the moon and the stars and all that. To me, I find it foolish. Why would you go out and worship a disc in the sky? Why would you go out and worship a light in the sky? People do things for their own benefit. People do things because they're going to have, they're going to have benefit from it, right? That's why liars lie, so that they get benefit. So they're getting benefit, aren't they? The creatures run of the world are getting benefit. They're getting a lot of earthly power. They're getting a lot of carnal power. I believe they're getting a lot of spiritual power as well over people. So then as I consider what I'm about to put down, I absolutely want to put this down first because I don't know. I don't know. Is this knowledge? I'll I'll put it down and, and, and say what I mean. So verse 25, and he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe. Like, look at this. So you're slow of heart to believe, right? You're slow of heart to believe because you don't have this light shining in your heart yet, right? So if you haven't got the light shining in your heart, well, then you're not going to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Now, the prophets believed it because the prophets were speaking this light, the whole way through, God at sundry times, they were speaking the words of the Holy Spirit, the word of God, yes, which is the seed, right? They were, they were speaking this the whole time. So if you don't have the light, well, you're not going to have in your heart to believe, are you? This for me is what's going on. As I put down this video this afternoon on the 19th of January, 2023, it's about six o'clock in the afternoon and now here on the New South Wales Central case, I'm at fever pitch. That's what's going on. It's absolutely what's going on. The spirit controls the heart and the heart controls the mind. And it's a war for our soul that's playing out in our mind by who owns our heart. And your heart is determined by what spirit you have, whether you've got the Holy Spirit or the spirit of man. I'm a fever pitch, man. That is what's going on. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? So a big part of that, of course, was Judas. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So mankind had full knowledge, for me, of the Old Testament. Full, full and utter. And the beginning of Moses, right? So Moses, it's my understanding, Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. And beginning of Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. He expounded to them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Now, is this saying that all the scriptures concern the Lord Jesus Christ? Or is he saying that, he expounded to them all the, all the times in the scriptures that were pertaining to him. That's the thing. Is every last scripture about the Lord Jesus Christ? I'm, I don't know. I, right now, I don't know. I'm, I'm of the view, I've got an inkling that it very well could have been because everything seems to be about the Lord Jesus Christ, right? So I've got a strong inkling it could be, but I that's just an inkling. It's just an inkling. So I'm quite 50-50 on it now. But at the very, very least, mankind at this point, a select few of mankind at this point, had full knowledge of all the scriptures that concerned the Lord Jesus Christ till then. 
right up to his ascension. Full knowledge. And they went nigh to the village, whither they went, and they made as though they would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for his toward evening, and the days far spent, and he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread, right, and blessed it, and broke them, and gave it to them. I'm being led to think here the Lord Jesus Christ has broken the body of Christ. But I'm being led to think he did the same thing at Passover. And this is what we get in Joshua 1.6, where they divided up the land. It's the same thing. Their, off, their office in the house, their brick in the building, and their field on the farm, and their mansion, their mansion in the house. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sights, right? So now, their eyes have been opened now, because I'm being led to think that they've now got this glorious light shining into their hearts, thus now, their hearts are believing because their eyes now have been opened and now they know him. That's what I'm being led to think. And he vanished. And they said one to another, did not our heart, oh boy, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way? Now, that's, that's before their eyes were opened, wasn't it? But their hearts were burning with us, within us. So light, a candle burns, a light is fire, right, maybe. And he talked with us, by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures. So Lord Jesus Christ has given them, for me, full understanding about all these scriptures. Every single last nook and cranny about those scriptures, everything that I'm sitting here laboring towards right now, that... I'm, I'm being led to think that anybody that I'm blessed enough to have watched my videos, you're laboring, your labor is the same. You just want, you want full understanding of these scriptures. Mankind had it. Now, the big thing is now, do mankind still have it? Has this knowledge been handed down? Has this knowledge been lost? Was this knowledge only meant for these people of this day? Did these people tell anybody else? Does this knowledge still exist? Because I look at these creatures running the world and they're not fools. They're, they're foolish and they're very, very deceived indeed, but they ain't idiots. They wield a lot of power on the earth and these dark forces that we don't know, they're not, I don't, for me, they're not naive. I think they're doing what they're doing willingly, but they, they are absolutely of the view that they can, they can defeat God. That, that's my understanding of them. So that's the thing. As I put down this next part of this video and these next few thoughts, that's ringing in my ears big time that mankind at this point in history had full knowledge of the scriptures and the Lord Jesus Christ and, and the role the Lord Jesus Christ played in the scriptures, right? All the way, even the New Testament, the whole lot. Because the, the, the apostles didn't know they were exceeding sorry when the Lord Jesus Christ, and it was withholding from them, just going on memory. It might even be that God did it. It was withholding from them. For me, the Sadducees knew, even though the Sadducees, by, by denying there was a resurrection, the Sadducees knew of the resurrection. Otherwise, they wouldn't be denying it. So they had knowledge of it. They just didn't believe it. For me, the Pharisees, they believed it, most certainly. And Paul tells them, Paul tells people in Acts, it was the hope of the fathers, the resurrection. And now you're, being, now you're bringing me into question for it. It's really interesting because for me, the disciples had no idea about the resurrection. But for me, other people did, like the Pharisees and Sadducees, even though the Sadducees didn't believe it. So it's interesting, right? These, these, these apostles, these disciples, they didn't believe. The Lord Jesus Christ is telling them, you're so hard of heart. Because you haven't had this glorious light shining into the, into your heart yet, but their heart of heart. But now their eyes were open; they knew him, and he opened the scriptures to them. So they know, right? Mankind at this at this particular moment in time had understanding of the scriptures. For me, full understanding at least about the Lord Jesus Christ and his role in those scriptures. Now, Sister Jamie, this, 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 this comment was absolutely incredible because it's just, it's allowed me to really, really, really now to, I think, solidify what I, I, you told me what I was thinking. 
I didn't know what I was thinking. But you told me absolutely what I was thinking. I'll explain, right? I listened to your last video again, and I do think we are saying the same thing in two different ways. Near the end, and that's exactly what was going on. Near the end, you say they worship the allegory. Now, just play this part of this video now. It goes for about two and a half minutes. It was towards the end of my video. I think it was two videos ago. I'll put up on screen what video it was. It was toward the end of the video. It goes for about, I'm gonna play the lead up to it as well because for me it's important trying to put down what I'm gonna put down now, just about why I'm seeing they're worshiping the, the, cre the creation rather than the actual creator, right? But in saying all this, mankind at some point had full knowledge, full knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ in these scriptures and potentially the entire book. They had full and utter understanding. Now, just this comment again, near the end you say they worship the allegory. I'll just play the clip now that you may be children of your father which is in heaven for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and the good s-u-n what they worship now this scripture psalm 19 and there's one in malachi 2 that i absolutely want to talk about next video have really baffled me for some time because this for me is pertaining to the god the lord jesus christ and it's the son Right, so you think, well, what gives here? Because that's a big no-no. We do not worship the sun. But an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So are we here using the sun in allegory to describe the light? Fever pitch. Fever pitch, fever pitch, fever pitch, right? Because you look at this one in Matthew 13, 6. This is the parable of the sower. The seed is the word of God. Mark 4. The key to understanding all parables is to understand that the seed is the word of God. This is a parable, so so is this, because the Son is the Holy Spirit in allegory here. So then you think about them worshipping the Son and the celestial bodies and Venus and the like. For me, they're worshipping the creature rather than the creator. They're actually worshipping the allegories. That's what I'm starting to see now. And we see it manifest as they worship the statue. But they're, they're worshipping the thing and not he that gave the thing. An earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So when does it stop being allegory and parable? And when does it start just being plain carnal? This is what I say. Where does the twain meet here? Where does it actually stop? Now, in saying all this, I've still got a lot of questions about what potentially is going on here. But as I say in that part of that video, in that, in that clip that I just shared, that's what's happening. The scriptures say that, for me, that's what the scriptures are saying. It's using the sun in allegory to describe the light, the light of the Holy Spirit. And they worship the sun. And I'm seeing it, I've been seeing it for so, so long, pretty much since the day I started doing this, that people are just reading this book carnally. Everything, you just see it carnally and it's, that, that, that's, I'll get to a couple of examples in, in just a sec because this now has just made me think on a whole, just a deception, right? So these people that are worshipping the sun, they're deceivers. So they're also deceived but they're not of God. They're not. They're not of God. They like you look at the Pope, for instance. He worships the sun. Now he's not of God, but yet he seems to be worshiping the allegory. He seems to be worshiping the earthly story. I'll get to that in just a sec. So come back now to this one in Second Corinthians three. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil and taken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. So if you don't have the Holy Spirit, for me, what this part of what this is saying is that you're carnal. You're reading this book carnally. So the, this, this book, I'm seeing it, the, the, the truth, it's just hidden. That veil is allegory. 
that's how I'm seeing it now, and that's my witness on the earth, that people are carnal. They're still reading the scriptures from behind this veil. It's just, I don't want to sit here and condemn anybody else. It's just my witness. It's just, it's just my testimony. Now, this one, right? This one's never far from my thoughts in James 2. I'll go, to, I'll go straight there in verse 19. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble, right? So this is the division. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. If you fear God, you will be saved. For me, these are the same things. This is the reverence that God is in control of everything. And this goes to absolute trust, fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and to depart from evil is understanding. It's the beginning of knowledge and wisdom and departing from evil is understanding. Knowledge of the holy is understanding. But the devils, the devils believe and the devils also fear. So there's more to consider, right, with all this because the devils aren't going to be saved, are they? I'm not being led to think. The devils are going to be saved. So now, come back to this comment from you, Sister Jamie. Near the end, you say they worship the allegory. My initial thought was how they, when they don't understand the allegory. Now, that's exactly where I'm at. Right now, that's what I'm seeing, and I don't understand. I don't understand why they're doing it. So you got you got the Pope, for instance. He's worshiping the Son because in the Scriptures. We're reading the Son, being, well, the Holy Spirit being described in allegory as the Son. Yeah, yeah it's now, it's it's now uh, Sunday morning. It's Sunday. What are we? The twenty, yes, yeah, the twenty second of January, and it's only about half past five here on the New South Wales Central Coast. But as you can hear, it's it's raining outside. I can't still can't go on my walk anyway because my leg's still not right. I just don't know what to do about this leg. It's no problem, but I just know as soon as I start walking hard and exercising on it and running, and it's just gonna, it's just gonna go again. So, it's all very, very, very depressing indeed. So I've got time here. I've done my pages. I've, I've got an hour or so here this morning. So I thought, why not? We'll get on here now and do this recording. So I just hope and pray that the, that the rain in the background isn't, isn't too loud. But that's exactly what you say is where I'm at. Near the end, you say they worship the allegory. My initial thought was how, when they don't understand the allegory. I say they worship the earthly carnal story and you say they worship the allegory, but I actually mean think we mean the same thing, right? And that's exactly what I'm saying, is that the allegory is the actual, it's the same thing. So when I'm saying worshiping the allegory, I'm saying that they're actually worshipping the earthly, earthly carnal story. So I try to put myself now into their shoes about what they're doing. So they're, so this, this scripture in James, the devils also believe and tremble. So the Pope's a devil, right? All of these harlots, they're all devils. So they believe and they tremble. And that's the division. That's the division. So when they're worshipping, so I say, I still don't get this, but when they're actually worshipping the allegory, why are they doing it? Are they, because these, there's two different things going on here for me. You've got the creatures running the world who are deceivers. That's where I'm vexed on. But people who are deceived themselves, it starts to become a lot more apparent here as to what is going on. Because I've done up a list here of that I'm just going to read. I'm just going to read out. I'm not going to. Well, no, I'll share the list. I'll, I'll share the list. So, so consider what I've got written on the screen here now, right? So this pertains to worship, both worship and also putting your confidence in, your trust in, being deceived in, right? So you look at the earth, earth worship. They worship the earth. So I go straight to global change. I go straight to global change. So an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. I'm seeing in the allegory, the earth is our heart. Now, then we've got the water and the sea. So the water for me is, is spiritual because whether it all, this is where, where do the twain actually meet here? 
because out of our belly shall flow these rivers of everlasting water. The water, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. These three agree on earth and in heaven, right? The water, the water baptism. And I've got baptism down here, right? So an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Again, I don't mean to, I don't want to condemn anybody or anything like that, but I want to get this right. I have to get this right. And we're in the body of Christ. We have to get this right. And sometimes, I don't know, We is it okay just to tiptoe around these things? We just want the truth. And I'm going to be absolutely fierce in that. I'm going to be fearless in that. An earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So you then look at the seasons, right? Because you, you read you read these scriptures and you, you think, well, okay, so it, I think it's summer. Summer, it's harvest time. But that if it's harvesting, it's got nothing to do, if it's farming, it's got nothing to do with... It's got nothing to do with the carnal. It's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning every time, right? The, the, the seasons. So when it's cold and when it's dark, right? Light and dark, night and day, right? And then you've got money. For me, I see money as the blessing. And same with gold and silver. And then you've got church and the church, right? So the church, the body of Christ, is a spiritual body. But then you've got church, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, worshipping the allegory, worshipping the earthly story, rather than the Creator, rather than the Holy Spirit, rather than Jehovah himself. And then you've got Israel as a people, and then you've got Israel as a place. Was Israel as a place ever carnal in the scriptures? Ever. Ever. Was it ever a physical place? But like, I read through those scriptures this morning. I'm in Joshua now. I read through those scriptures this morning and they're going to place their feet everywhere they place the soles of their feet in the land of Canaan. But where's Canaan today? It's not that little slither of land. I've just been reading it in Joshua. It's absolutely massive, this, this place. So I, it's not... I don't, I, I, as I go on and on, it's not resembling at all. The, the, the scriptures doesn't resemble that little sliver of land over there at all. Not, not at all. So you look at Israel as a people today and you look at who Israel actually is today, an earthly story with a heavenly, with a, with a heavenly meaning, right? They're worshipping and they're putting their trust and their confidence in the allegory, the earthly story, rather than the truth. How far does this go, right? Israel is a people and Israel is a place. What they call Holy Communion. So you go to your church and you... This is what I'm saying at the moment. The reason, One of the reasons I'm reading these things out is because if we do these things, are we actually worshipping a graven image? Because I've said before that if you go, you've got to go to a church and you, I'm not condemning anybody, I'm not judging anybody, I just want to get this right... But I've said before, if you want to go to a church and you want to jump in a swimming pool and say you're baptised, that's fine. You go for it. I'm not, I'm not going to stop you, right? And that hasn't stopped. I, I'm not going to stop anybody from doing anything. No, no, no. Who am I, right? I'm, I'm not. No, no. I'm in the body of Christ and we're in the body of Christ. We have to get this right. So you go to the church and what if, what if because I, I'm not moved whatsoever to go and eat something physically that the Lord Jesus Christ said, take, eat, this is my body, take, drink, this is this is my blood. Because I know in my heart that's spiritual. I've known that for a long time. For me, the Lord Jesus Christ, he was dividing up the body of Christ. That's what he was doing at Passover in the scripture I just shared after he's, after he's resurrected. That's what he was doing. So is it, are we, is that what worshipping a graven image actually is? And these creatures running the world is a part why they're doing it is because they want to encourage it. So the devils believe and also tremble. So you look at somebody like the Pope, does he know the allegory? Because you think, if they don't know the allegory, well then, and I'm in truth, which I'm growing in more and more confidence that I am, well that means I know the allegory. And it's like you look at the you look at the Mark Mark four Luke eight and the and the gateway to understanding all of these parables is to realise that the seed is the word of God. That's the gateway to understanding all of these parables. Now I know that it's written in the Bible. I know that right, and 
if I'm in truth with all these things, the earthly story with the heavenly meaning, the, the, the clip that I just shared, the sun, for example, does that mean I know and they don't know? I'm not thinking that for a minute. I think they do know. But they don't have the spirit. And the Lord Jesus Christ, that's why he said they spoke in, in parable. Because the devils would know, wouldn't they? About these parables. And if the devils know, people like the Pope know. That's the thing. That's the thing. There's, there's two levels. There's cre the creatures running the world. And then there's the... And then there's the people that are deceived, the people that they're actually deceiving. So they go and, and they serve this communion and they know it's a lie. They know it's wor worshipping a graven image. They know it's worshipping the creature rather than the creator. That's what I'm saying. All of this is. That's what they were doing right through the Old Testament. It was all symbolic. They're all just... They're, it, it could be as simple as that they were all carnal. And they thought this is, this is godly, and they, as people do today. And I've got baptism there as well. So if you go and get water baptised, if I'm in truth, are you actually worshipping a graven image? Are you actually, because you're making something that's that, that's spiritual, you're turning it into something that's physical. An earthly story with a heavenly meaning, right? And they worship the works of their own hands and they worship the creature rather than the creator because they don't understand the parables. My fever pitch, that's what's going on here. But you look at the creatures running the world, and that's and that's Jamie's comment, isn't it? How? How? When they don't understand the allegory. But what if they do? But the thing is, that's why the, this is why I'm so vexed. The Lord Jesus Christ, that's why he spoke in allegory, so that the, the kingdom of heaven won't be known to them. So baptism, right? And then eating and fasting. I see this a lot. I see this a lot. People just don't eat for three days or people just won't eat for five days. I do that. I just, I, I go stark right the man. I become angry. My head hurts. I can't function. The Lord wants us to eat. And I, I read the other day where Moses, he didn't eat or drink for 40 days and 40 nights when he went up to see the Lord. So if it's carnal, can you eat and not, not, not eat and drink for 40 days and survive? I don't reckon. I mean, how, how long can you go without actually having water? It can't be long. So the fact, I did a video, two videos, I think it was for memory on fasting about 12 months ago. And eating, Leviticus 11, for me, that's what you can eat spiritually and what you can't eat spiritually. And then we've got eating and, and being awake. Of course, there's a spelling error. It wouldn't be me. There wasn't a spelling error. Sleeping and, and being awake. Sleeping and being awake, right? So we read that right through the scriptures. We, we, we're the children of the day, and we don't and we don't sleep. And and light and dark, right? Being asleep and being awake. And you think about those scriptures they use for that rapture doctrine in in First Thessalonians four. We're awake. That some sleeping Christ, right? What does that mean? Are they dead or are they just still asleep? And then we've got father, mother, husband, wife and children, and also sex. Where the twain, for me, me. Because what I'm seeing now is that the man sows the seed, and for me that's spiritual, that's, that seeds the word of God, and then the woman conceives the seed. And what I can see is that by the man sowing the seed, that means the woman then conceives the seed. You think about that carnally, that's absolutely what goes on. So the seed comes from the man. So then when you think about the allegory with the with the seed entering into the earth, where does that seed come from? For me, it comes from previous truths. It comes from the previous generation. So where does the seed first come from? It comes from God. There's a, I see a bit of a difference between between people and plants there, but I, but I could be wrong. And then there's the Sabbath, right? Then there's the Sabbath. I observe the Sabbath. I observe, what do they call it? They call it, is it Shabbat? People think they're all great because I worship this. Well, I, I observe the Sabbath. Are, are you actually, what I'm saying is, are we making something that's spiritual and giving it a physical presence? And is a part of the deception as well, the fact that they worship these statues. So you look at the Pope and all of them, they worship statues. And we straight away think that that's worshipping a graven image. But by them taking their communion and getting baptised and observing the Sabbath and eating and, 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 and fasting and, and, and picking and choosing what we eat, 
for me, that, that potentially is worshipping the creature rather than the creator. And it's walking in the imagination of your own heart. For me, it's all, it's all tying in. And then I've got singing and instruments. Like how far does this actually go? Because remember the prophet, they're the organ. And that's who we are. We're the organ for the Lord. Now for me, it's not physical. It never has been physical where I run around exalting, where I run around exalting the Lord. It's never been that for me. I don't do that because it's, to me, that's ramming it down people's throats and people are going to be repelled and they're going to run the other way. For me, if I ever get a chance to talk about the Lord Jesus Christ, it is an opportunity that's given to me by grace and I cherish it and I relish it. It's never by a work of my own hand. I never, ever force this down anyone straight ever because you do that. How do you know when the Holy Spirit's actually working and when he's not? When you leave it all over to the Holy Spirit and then you get opportunities, then you can sing like a bird, right? But I don't, no one wants to hear my singing. <laughs> no one wants to hear my singing and for me we exalt and we sing the praises of the lord just by simply walking in the gospel and just simply by following after him and by our very works deeds thoughts for me that's singing the praises of the lord and being the prophets we're the lord's organ there's no physical organ there's no physical singing there's no physical running around saying how great the lord jesus christ is it's all spiritual how far how far does this actually go, right? An earthly story with a heavenly moaning. I'm out of time again. I'm out of time, but I have to I have to share this. So I don't know. I don't know. Just consider this, right? I, I, I ask for your consideration and all I want, as you know, all I want is the truth and to get this right. I've got to get this right. I feel what I do here, I've got an enormous responsibility and I want to get it right is actually being water baptized in the flesh is it actually a sin yes there was an event in acts 8 because always in those scriptures there's one scripture that leads me to think there's more to consider yeah that, absolutely but for me i'll never get physically water baptized as i see things now never never i've never been simply because up until now simply because i haven't felt it was the right thing to do and there's nobody who I would, to, to me, the person that baptizes me would have to have a higher ap appetite for the Holy Spirit than me, potentially. But they would have to be more advanced than me, more elder than me. And I've never met anybody like that in the flesh ever. There's nobody simply to do it. So the Holy Spirit has taken that out of my hands. It's my testimony that I can't go to church. I've tried going to church, three different, three different churches, well, four now, and it doesn't work. It just, it never, never works out. It's not the place for me. So going and taking this Holy Communion, it's not for me. Being water baptized, it's not for me. Sitting in a church and singing happy songs, it's not for me. It's not my testimony, right? So now I think to myself, I think, well, it's not my testimony because my testimony is the testimony of Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit that's dwelling within me. So it's not my testimony. So it's, it's the testimony the Holy Spirit's given me. Ah, oh, is your experience different? Do you feel there's a need to go and get water baptized? Do you feel like I could be in error here? I always feel like I could be because I don't know everything, but to me, that's what's going on here. There's, there's definitely two different things going on. You've got the creatures running the world on one side and then you've got the deceived on the other. The deceived, I'm seeing it. It's just standing out like a vegan on a hill now. that that's what they're doing. And that's what these scriptures was pertaining to all the way through. They were worshipping the creature rather than the creator. It goes deeper than just bowing down before statues. It goes far, far deeper than that. And you think about Ezekiel, and it was it Ezekiel 8 when they all, all the all the pictures on the walls. To me, that's what's going on, is that they're, they're all, it's, it's about being carnal or spiritual. This book, I had, I've got a term actually, I've got a term written down that I, that I wanted to share, it's like, and I can't find it, which comes as absolutely no surprise for me. I'm going to go through every single page, go backwards and forwards before I, before I get it. So it cloaked behind that veil of allegory. So that's where the truth is. The truth is cloaked behind that veil of allegory. And 
if you're deceived, you're still behind that veil and that veil has now been taken away in Christ. That veil in reading the Old Testament. This scripture here, verse 14, is for me, this is pertaining to an earthly story with a heavenly meaning and their minds were blinded because they're carnal. They're not seeing it. They're not seeing that it's all allegory and they're being literal. And that's what all of this is. And that's what this list is. I'm a fever pitch, man. I'm a fever pitch, fever pitch. That's what's going on. Now, I want to... I have to finish here, I think, because I've got, I've still got heaps more. I've got heaps more. I, oh my goodness, I've got heaps more, and I'm up to two and a half hours. It's so very, very frustrating. So Tony Blair, I've got to, I've got to, I've got to talk about this because I talked about it earlier. He's spoken again. I think there's a huge impetus now for a national digital infrastructure. Digitization in, in healthcare is, I think, one of the great game changers. You know, we should be helping countries to develop a national digital infrastructure, which they will need with these new vaccines. In the end, you, 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 you need the data. You need to know who's been vaccinated and who hasn't been. Some of the vaccines that will come on down the line will be multiple. There'll be multiple shots. So you've got to have, for, for reasons to do with the healthcare more generally, but certainly for a, a pandemic or for um, for, for vaccines, you've got to have a proper digital infrastructure, and many countries don't have that. In fact, most countries don't have that. So I asked earlier whether it's godly to forgive this man or not. So he's at that World Economic Forum for a start, which I'm seeing more and more, it's just a ruse. For me, it's people being awake in the dark. If you're awake and you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're awake because you're seeing what man is doing. And I look at what's going on with this World Economic Forum and all of it, and you've got so much going on at the moment. I'm seeing in America, they seem to be disclosing the truth about the assassination of that bloke back in the 60s. And that's where the CIA, my understanding, that's where the CIA coined that term conspiracy theorist. It's all coming out and it's not, it's not organic. It's all being done by them. Every single last part of it is part of the agenda. It's all being done by them. And he's at that World Economic Forum for a start, this bloke, which is, to me, it's just a gigantic ruse. Now, it's real in terms that they're, they're pushing towards their agenda and all that, but that's not the agenda. They're showing people the evil. That's the, that's the and I'm seeing so many truthers, they're just falling for it, hook, line, and sinker. And I'm seeing it more and more and more, just in the general public, people just have this awareness of the World Economic Forum but they don't have the Holy Spirit. So it's the wisdom of the world and any wisdom of the world, it's devilish because it doesn't come from above, right? But anyway, I see, I see he's there for a start, but then he's talking about digital, digital medical records so we can store people's demon juice statuses, right? I don't want none. I don't want none of my medical records, thanks, on no database, not ever. My, my medical records are to be on paper with my doctor and only my doctor can see them. I've been very, very clear to my doctor about that. And he, he agrees, he agrees. That's, that's, that's how we go about it. Now, you look at, it, nobody's, it's nobody else's business, none, nobody, nobody else's business, what your demon juice status is, none. Nobody's business. It's your private medical records. It's just like now, if somebody was to die and it was labeled the purple dragon, can I have a look at their medical records, please? No, they're private. So how come it's a, how come it's a demand that you that that, that that I give over your my medical records? This digital database, right? So he's just he's just absolutely. So you look at this is what I say. You look at his so-called confession earlier. For that decision today, I accept full responsibility without exception and without excuse it's all a ruse it's all fake it's all fake so why has he done it there's got to be a reason why he's done it right you look at that new zealand prime minister she's just resigned out of nowhere she didn't want to do that she's been tapped it's very very obvious she's been tapped it's all happening it's all happening why did tony blair do that why why would he come out now and confess that and then, and then hobble over to the World Economic Forum and exalt the demon juice. It's 
To me, it's what's going on. To me, it's what's going on. They're, 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 Satan's just completely declaring his hand so that the world will, the world will embrace the false light. The world will embrace the false light. Now, this this bloke, this is the guy I did that I did that video on the on the third page, which was a joy to do. He dressed up as Prince Charles, and the, the, it all went a little bit crazy here for a few days. But it's it's died down now. So this is Dominic Perrichet, our premier. And need I explain? Need I describe anything, anything whatsoever, any further on this on this page? Right? They're all just cut from the same cloth, and it's just. Do, I think I don't know. I, I, I've asked the question a lot previously. Do they have? Do they actually have? I'm very very itchy because my sunburn's getting itchy. Do they actually have the ability to repent? These creatures. For me, what Tony Blair's just done, it just leaves me a fever pitch that they don't. They just. It's just not in them. There's something. There's something inherently evil, and different about those people. These giants. I'm very glad to think this bloke is a giant. Absolutely. So we'll finish out here. I don't want to finish. I've still got heaps to go. First Thessalonians 5.23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Occupants within our house, right? The occupants within our house. What makes me me? What makes you you? Where do our thoughts come from? Where do our belief systems come from? Where do our emotions come from? Our feelings. Where does it all come from? This is a, this is a, going to be the, the the main scripture I was going to share today, and I may start out next video on this, but I am seeing a lot in the scriptures at the moment that I want to share, so I don't know what the next video is going to be yet. Yet, Psalm one hundred three one. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Right. Multiple occupants that make up our house. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, that is within me. All that is within me, sorry. Bless his holy name. And the Lord, the God of peace, sanctify you holy. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Your whole spirit, soul and body. Our body's not going to see corruption. Body, soul and spirit and all that within me. Bless his holy name, right? And for me, this isn't physical. This isn't physical. It's not running around saying Jesus is great and all the rest of it. We bless. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and everything that's within him. Bless his holy name, right? It's not about going to church and singing and getting on instruments and all that. I don't know. I don't know. To, to me, it seems, it seems a little bit weird that that would be a sin in itself. But is it because you're deceived? I don't know. I don't know. So, a couple of closing thoughts, and I want to I want to share a couple more in Deuteronomy. I might finish. I might finish on these ones. I consider this. Well, I'll, I'll I'll do this. So, in Deuteronomy twenty eight, we're receiving the curses, right? I'm just going to skip over it now because I'm out of, completely out of time. So, the pestilence I see is unclean spirits. They're infesting your land, your heart, right? So, that's an unclean spirit. That's infesting your heart. That's that's Zechariah twelve four. Big scriptures. Now, corn, wheat, wine, and oil. So corn and wheat, wine and oil for me are just becoming absolutely intense, right? So when when the curses are come upon us, we're not going to drink of the wine. We're not gonna we're not gonna anoint ourselves with oil. Now, when they beget sons and daughters, you shall not enjoy them because you're going to go into captivity, right? And then we get the twain here. We get the twain here because I'm being led to think that your sons and daughters, earthly story with a heavenly meaning, are actually the trees and the fruit of our land. So the trees are our garden, our land is our heart, and the fruit is our works, our deeds, our children, and our offspring, right? This is where the twain for me meet. The man sows the seed in his heart, and the woman, she conceives the, the son and the daughter in her womb, right? This is the allegory here. Potentially, if the twain does meet, this is where it meets, right? And the stranger that is within thee. This has become huge. Deuteronomy for me this time has been absolutely incredible. Thou shalt be a sign for a, for a wonder and upon thy seed forever, right? Thy seed forever. It's not our carnal children that come after us. No, it's not that. It's not that. It's our works. It's our deeds. It's our offspring from our land. But get this. It's all about... 
It's all on Jeremiah 31, 12, but I'm out of time. The Lord, if you, the, because of the curses, the Lord's going to bring this nation from afar, right? Now he's going to eat the fruit of thy cattle, the fruit of thy land until they be destroyed, which also shall not leave thee either corn, wine, oil, or the increase of thy kind or flocks of thy sheep until he hath destroyed he, right? Because in Jeremiah 31, in the end, in the end times, the outcome of the progression of faith, we're going to come for the wheat, wine, and oil, and for the young of flock and the herd, and our soul will be as a watered garden, right? And they shall not sorrow any more at all. So our soul is the watered garden, and that's what we're getting. This is the watered garden, but it's now being destroyed due to sin because our sons and daughters. They've gone into captivity, right? Our works, our fruits of our works are carnal and now we're having the locust consume it, right? The locust and the and the pestilence are now consuming our land. So everything now in our land is corrupt. So what happens to a corrupt land that's not bringing forth life, right? Come into Deuteronomy 29. We're getting all the curses again, right? And the whole land, now get this, get this, get this. I'll go 22. So the generation to come of your children that shall rise up after you and the stranger that shall come from a far land shall say when they see the plagues of the land, the sicknesses, which the Lord has laid upon it, right? So we've got a land now that's not giving life. It's just any life that comes from this land, it's just getting devoured straight away. And that whole land thereof is brimstone and salt and burning that is not sown, nor beareth any grass groweth therein, like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah and Admar and Zebah, and the Lord overthrew in his anger and his wrath, right? Now I see on the earth now that there was gigantic golf balls coming out of heaven and it devoured people because they were all gay and lesbians, right? An earthly story with a heavenly meaning. That's what's happening. When you've when you've got a land, when you've got a land that's not giving life, that land becomes completely barren and arid, and it's just a, a complete and utter desolate wasteland. Why? Because they've forsaken the covenant and they went and served other gods. They've worshipped the creature rather than the creator. And this is allegory, right? Because just like these, he's rooted up. Any any tree that the father didn't plant, he's going to be rooted up. The Lord Jesus Christ he himself says this. Trees that fruit, whether it's twice dead, twice dead, plucked up from the roots. It's all allegory. It just this just come in yesterday. That's what that's what this is. If you if you don't serve the Lord your God, well then your heart's just going to be a barren wasteland. It's going to end up just like Sodom and Gomorrah. That's what it's talking about. It's another manifestation where the earth thinks. Sodom and Gomorrah was just because everybody was just gay and lesbian and they had transgender people everywhere that the Lord just had enough and he, he rained fire and brimstone from heaven. There was these big golf balls that come out. No, no it was just men's hearts had just completely forsaken the Lord. Thus, their soul no longer is as a water garden. Just a couple, a couple of closing thoughts because I was out of time half an hour ago. The Lord controls our heart this is how i'm seeing things now so this is a war for our for our soul that's going on in our mind that's determined by who owns our heart the lord gives us our spirit so that he can search us he gives us his spirit so that we can search him so that's how the lord controls our hearts for me he does it with our spirit now we in the body of christ as I say before, we've now got our seed. We've got the seed, the word of God dwelling within us. And we've also got the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. That's what I'm starting to see here. We come back into De De Deuteronomy 28. That's what I'm seeing our sons and our daughters actually are. These are our spiritual offspring. These are our spiritual fruit that has been birthed from our seed that we're tilling in our land. And our land is our heart. Because our heart now has the Holy Ghost dwelling and the seed, the word of God, for me, the same thing, dwelling. So now the Lord, he controls. He controls us because his spirit is our spirit. And you cannot confess Jesus is Lord, but by that Holy Ghost. We've all got our one seed that makes up our part of the Holy Spirit that owns our heart. So in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says he's given everybody his own seed. Everybody his own seed. And that's what we are. We've all got our seed 
Abraham's seed was the seed of faith. You've got your seed. I've got my seed. That manifests as our office. That manifests as our brick in the house. Our field on the farm and our, our field on the farm is our heart and the plants are our garden and we're going to come into Zion for corn, wine and oil and our soul shall be as a watered garden. That's where I'm at right now. An amazing video to do. I have learned a great deal during this video. I did the I did the video over on the main page as well. That's sitting well. I feel as though it went okay. I, I may do that again. I'm not sure. But this one has just been absolutely incredible. I just feel as though I, I've just learned so, so much. But that's the thing with the earthly story, with the heavenly meaning and worshipping the creature and the physical thing, the actual image of the story. I see there's two different things going on. There's a creature's run of the world. Do they know it's parable? For me, they must. They simply must. They simply must. How is it possible? That means I know if I'm in truth, which I think I am, I know, and then they don't know. Has people known this in the past? Yeah, because they did. The Lord Jesus Christ told them. The Lord Jesus Christ opened the scriptures to mankind. Now, did those apostles, did they defile that information? It's hard to know, right? It's hard to know. You wouldn't have thought so. But have they, everybody that they talked to and delivered the gospel, did they receive that information? And no, people, a lot of people walked away, didn't they? And the Lord corrupts the seed. Is there any seed outside the word of God? It's starting to look like to me there's not. The Lord gives everybody his seed and then it's up to us what we do with it. To me, that's where, that's where I'm at. That's where I'm at. Anybody that's got anything out of this video, I do thank you from the bottom of my heart. It's been a joy to do, and it's been way too long, but that's just how I roll. I'll finish it there. And all the power and all the glory goes to the Lord. I've got to be quiet because it's only 6 a.m. Goes to the Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Woo! <laughs> the King. When I was a younger man, I hadn't a care Fooling around Hitting the town Growing my hair You came along And stole my heart When you entered my life Ooh babe You got what it takes So I made you my wife Since then I never looked back it's almost like living a dream And ooh